position of a, of a reflective activist or participatory scholar, uh, positioning not as an outsider observer, but as a participant agent in the, in the activity, in the enterprise. And I want to talk first about the history of community informatics. Um, what do I mean by community informatics? It's the, uh, the use of information technology to <clears throat> enable and empower the grassroots. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's a kind of general definition. I want to elaborate on that uh, as I'm talking. Uh, so the history of community informatics uh, goes back uh, about 15 years. Uh, to the community networking activities, uh, which were the attempt to create grassroots internet access, um, uh, largely in well, largely in North America and Eastern Europe, uh, and sorry, in Western Europe, uh, largely middle class and um, university oriented at the beginning, often promoted by academics, but an attempt to provide internet access. Uh, when internet access was either technically uh, infrastructure and available or was extremely costly. Um, so the, the idea was it was starting from local community access centers in North America and in Europe, uh, and it was very utopian. The idea was that internet access was somehow a, uh, tied into a broader uh, movement towards uh, um, social change, towards social liberation. This wasn't explicit, but it was implicit in most of the, the uh, those who were engaged in that kind of an enterprise. Um, and much of the rhetoric, uh, at least uh, as it moved forward, and the funding came through the discussion around the digital divide. So the notion that some people would have access and others wouldn't have access really drove the, the notion of community access or public access uh, to the development of these public access centers, uh, drove them out from the ac uh, academic community into the, the larger community. Uh, it was, they were linked, for example, to the network of community technology centers in the US and many actually in less developed countries, which were places for tech training, access, and support, and with strong initial links to the black empowerment uh, uh, tech training within church-based uh, activities and uh, church-based enterprise in the U.S. And there were thousands of these, thousands of these uh, tech centers, uh, thousands of these community access centers, mostly in the developed countries. Uh, so the, the community informatics was a, a, a way of putting a, an academic gloss on this. And it was multidisciplinary, consisted of academic activists, uh, but not academic activism. Uh, and there were uh, global meetings of uh, these people, the community networking movements writ large, uh, that had a, up to 1,000, 1,200 people uh, gathered at meetings in Barcelona, first of all in 1999, then in Buenos Aires in 2000, and then in Montreal in 2001, at which time the, the movement kind of imploded and, ex and, and fragmented for a variety of reasons which I won't go into. But the attempt was to get the grassroots communities recognized as owners or users of the technology. That is, owners or users, users of the technology alongside, for example, corporates with management information systems and governments with uh, government information systems. You would have communities with community information systems, and community technology systems, which, which would be designed to support uh, community activities and uh, community goals. Uh, and, but the, the intent was very much normative rather than objective. It was towards empowerment and how to achieve this. So the interests were practitioner and policy questions rather than ac questions of, ac of objective academic research. Um, at this, at this in, the, in the middle of this, the World Summit of the Information Society w um, developed, which was the, the grand meeting of the globe on uh, information, uh, information society, information empowerment, uh, information and development. And to some degree, community informatics developed in opposition to uh, the World Summit of the Information Society. Because the information society, the WISIS, as it was called, was really a triumph of NGOism, but almost no real participation by the grassroots. Uh, users and practitioners really weren't involved and really weren't invited. Uh, the grassroots that was involved were the the bells and feathers kind of grassroots where they, they brought a few 
people from the Amazon uh, in full regalia and presented them as the grassroots involvement. <laughs> um, and that was it. That was the grassroots involvement. The, the WISIS was a very largely a top-down uh, a, a top process with some involvement by uh, essentially top-down NGOs, NGOs without a, a huge amount of grassroots involvement. Um, so there is uh, some links to uh, the, the development of some links to community development and grassroots development and various self-empowerment movements in various parts of the world. But one of the things that WISIS did was to uh, create a much more substantive link between development processes and uh, development in less developed countries and these kind of grassroots initiatives that you found in, in developed countries. Um, so the, the theoretical position, if you want, of kind of the community informatics, the community networking, the, the, tombs, the two terms are kind of used almost, uh, one, the community networking is used by the practitioners, community informatics would be used by the academics, really is about empowering or enabling grassroots communities through the use uh, of ICTs, which meant that it was focused not on the individual user, but on the collective user, the coll not going into the issue of how you define community at this point, long discussion, but the notion of the community is being, uh, the community is as the community does. That is the community is emergent. Uh, it is um, uh, what the, the, the definition of the community became, the, who was in fact owner of or responsible for the, the particular initiative that was, was happening at the local level. So it was strongly process oriented. Uh, concerned with community development, linked with community development, had to do with community learning, community-based health initiatives, community memory, and so on, cult cultural learning. Um, uh, at the roughly the same time, the <clears throat> as internet access was becoming much more widespread, much cheaper in developed countries, uh, the uh, the major uh, um, donors. Uh, the World Bank, uh, the UNDP, uh, the bilaterals began to take on the, the, uh, the notion of community-based technology development and the notion of telecenters uh, as the focal point through which public access to the internet would be provided in less developed countries was taken, taken on and became the basis of really very, very large initiatives by, again, by the World Bank, by the UNDP, by UNESCO, by uh, Uncle Tom Cobley and all. So the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the development of this activity of, of uh, telecenters in the less developed countries led to perhaps 100,000 or more of these telecenters being formed. Um, so telecenters became, uh, I think, it, I mean, it's arguable, but my own perception was, became the major strategy for ICT for development. Uh, roughly at the, just around the time of WISIS or, or immediately after. It was the flavor of the day. Uh, and so there's funding for many local NGOs, major funding. Unfortunately, it ended up in major and very embarrassing failures. Uh, very embarrassing failures. You know, you'd have uh, uh, Nakaseki in, in Uganda opened uh, quite a large amount, of half a million dollars put in by the World Bank, uh, quite a lot of uh, 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 Photo ops, uh, vice president of the World Bank would show up, ministers would show up, the photo ops would happen. There'd be funding for one or two years. Uh, the funding would dry up. Uh, and uh, Nakaseki was, uh, was burned down in a mysterious fire about a year and a half after, after the funding disappeared. Kotmali and Sri Lanka, basically the same process. I don't think it was burned down. It just quietly disappeared. I was told the other day that Somebody went to, to Sri Lanka and it was apparently still on the map, but it, it, had, it had gone. Nobody could find it. Nobody talked about it. It was gone. And remember, the, uh, so the, um, uh, at this time amongst the major partners in this was, ooh, uh, was uh, Microsoft. Microsoft partnered with IDRC amongst others. Uh, not one of its, I'd say, not one of uh, IDRC's most glorious moments. Uh, and uh, initiated a conflict a competition between corporate telecenters and grassroots telecenters. So notably in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, there was a very large and significant initiative of, of uh, grassroots initiated telecenters, which uh, were really in competition with and ultimately destroyed by the uh, Microsoft, IDRC, and uh, uh, 
I think the World Bank were involved in this in this program uh, to create a Microsoft based uh, top down initiated uh, uh, telecenters uh, and with the the, the, the structure being uh, um, uh, largely generated by these quite large, uh, not corporate, corporate, but quite large, uh, non-responsible, uh, uh, non-grassroots accountable organizational systems. So the, um, uh, if you put the, the two of these together, that is the top-down system and the, the failures of much of these networks, uh, one of the lessons that came uh, came forward was that the top-down systems just didn't work. Uh, there was a, f um, um, I've got time limitations. Uh, but in the meantime, we've had uh, significant changes in the technology environment uh, of, for community-based or grassroots-based uh, technology. We've had broadbands, we've had mobiles, we've had the ubiquity of, 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 uh, of uh, technology and cultural changes, social media and social networking, and the shifting of the political culture uh, from the center of gravity to, uh, significantly to the right. Um, uh, but I think the initial intent of promoting grassroots initiatives through uh, technology uh, were, I think, uh, by and large, I think are generally seen as, as failures, uh, because of the na there's a notion that the naive, naive that the technology could be used locally without mediation. That there was no need for mediating, interpreting, translating the technology into something that will work at the grassroots. There was a na the naive that the driver of the technology could be a secular driver. There was no need for an, ex an outside driver that somehow the technology would would be sufficient. And naive, but, naive about the power of inertia, that is that the inertia at the grassroots uh, would be overcome by the technology and somehow the possibility of the ownership of the technology at the grassroots uh, would happen without any external kind of initiative happening. And there's naive about theories of, of social change at the grassroots. Um, I just want to make a couple of examples, uh, just to point to a couple of, of successful examples because I think they, they give a, uh, an interesting kind of set of potentials. The, the most successful, successful uh, I would say, grassroots uh, based uh, community informatics impl impl implementations were amongst indigenous peoples. Uh, Barrio and Sarawak uh, and the Cree in northwestern Ontario, uh, even a completely buried tribe of indigenous people living on a land reserve in the middle of urban Sao Paulo that I, I ran across at one point. Um, they were able to achieve true empowerment and transformation through the use of technology. In Ontario, the uh, indigenous group created their own high school, uh, created a, uh, a functioning uh, indigenous controlled e-health program, developed the use of information technology to support e-governance programs, used the uh, technology as a means to enable their, the, local, the preservation of the local culture, uh, and uh, ultimately uh, created and owned their own mobile, uh, mobile, mobile system of mobiles for because the uh, uh, corporates wouldn't, uh, wouldn't provide the system. In Barrio, uh, e economic transformation through ecotourism was achieved and the basis, and the technology provided the basis for cultural survival through an online journal and links, linking to the diaspora and the, the language survival. The reasons why, to my mind, the indigenous were successful was because of the strong links to the low land. Uh, in many cases, the use of ICTs in rural areas is a means to facilitate migration. Uh, for indigenous peoples, ICTs are a means to s for IC for indigenous people, ICTs are a means to stay where they are and have some degree of equitable access to services. So, just a few, just to conclude, a few observations. Uh, the community informatics fundamentally and, gen and genetically is about inclusion. But from experience, it's clear that digital inclusion, at least, cannot be mandated from above. It can only be achieved through a process of self-empowerment from below. Uh, attempts to link even ICT-enabled grassroots communities into larger networks are difficult and time-consuming and even more difficult to sustain since the benefits to the local community are unclear. 
The grassroots benefited, however, significantly from the networking of their intermediary organization or la leadership cadres. And those intermediary organizations, which, which were the most networked, were often the most successful in that they had access to information resources, including financial, that those which were less networked had much less access to. So the, the lesson being that the, <coughs> the grassroots organizations that were successful, in fact, had intermediaries between themselves and the larger society that that did the networking. It wasn't the grassroots organization themselves. <coughs> um, and ICTs through the intermediaries did function to more effectively link communities into larger society, but not necessarily network them into larger society. Networking was done by intermediaries. Linkages uh, were functional for e-commerce, narrowly focused service information delivery, and political representation and power. These communities weren't included through ICTs in the larger society, but they were more effectively linked. That is, they were linked to the larger society, but they weren't networked into the larger society. However, their networking, their networking horizontally to other of their <coughs> cultural, linguistic, geographical brothers uh, acted to strengthen them politically and to provide practical support to their various online initiatives through increased, <coughs> through increased in numbers. Um, so just in, to conclude, uh, where to from here? The, the utopian vision of the use of ICTs, that is information and technology as instruments of self-empowerment and ultimate liberation is to my mind still valid. Mobiles as an instrument of indivi individuation, of networked individualism, of technology-induced alienation still proceeds apace. There appears to be a universal urge towards community, towards the, th <coughs> the trust of int intimate relations, towards the possibility of shared culture, norms, rituals, towards the achievement of collaboratively determined goals and realization of collectively agreed upon norms. This is manifested but truncated and subverted through social media. If, and it is a big if, we are, we are to, it, to, as a species, survive the onrushing totalitarianism of the surveillance, I prefer to call it the digital control state, then it will not be through networking individuals, but through digitally enabling communities built on the basis of trust and interpersonal sharing of norms, values, and goals, very likely acting through some sort of intermediary structures on the basis of which resistance and ultimately the retaking of the means of digital empowerment and ultimately digital liberation will be achieved. 